Treasure of Alpheus Winterborn by John Belair's Chapter 9. The four-story tower that stood at the northwest corner of the library had fascinated Anthony ever since he had started working there. It was mysterious, in fact. It was like one of Alpheus Winterborn's riddles. Although it was built onto the corner of the building, you couldn't get into it from any of the rooms upstairs or down that were in the part of the library that touched the tower. There were no doors on the outside of the tower either. At first, Anthony thought that the whole silly thing was sealed off from the outside world, like a tomb. But when he asked Miss Eels if there was any way to get into the tower, she merely smiled mysteriously and said, Keep looking, you'll find a way. Finally, about two weeks after he had started his job, he found a way to get in. In the furnace room behind the furnace, he, he, ah, he had found a door with a cardboard sign tacked onto it. The sign said, Broom Closet. But he thought this was a funny place for a broom closet. So, on a hunch, he took down the sign, and underneath he saw peeling gilt letters that simply said, Stairs. Nearby on a rusty nail hung a key. It fit the lock on the door. Behind the door was a flight of stone steps that corkscrewed up four stories to a small round room at the top. Ever since that day, the tower room had become one of Anthony's favorite places. He went there with a lot of... He went there a lot when business in the library was slow, or when he just wanted to sit and think. Right now, Anthony definitely wanted somewhere, some place where he could just sit and think. A lot of things had happened to him in a very short space of time, and his head was in a whirl. The Tweedies were moving, Miss Eel's house had been broken into, and the mirror had been stolen. Anthony climbed the steps to the top of the tower like somebody lost in a dream. When he got to the top, he opened a low-pointed door and went into the tower room. He sat down cross-legged on the floor and looked around. There was no furniture in the room. Dust and the tiny bodies of dead insects covered the floor. Over in one corner, near a window, lay a pile of old magazines. The tower room, when you came to think of it, was pretty useless. There wasn't even an electric light in it, or an outlet where you could plug one in. In the middle of the ceiling was a trap door. Anthony had never opened it, but he figured that it led up to the roof of the tower. When the wind blew hard, he could hear the weather vane rattling overhead. The room had nine oval windows. Today, in the gray light of an overcast October, today the gray light of an overcast October day filtered in through the grimy panes. Anthony sat there, motionless, looking out. Away on the western horizon ran a long line of bluffs. Below him, he could see the tops of bare trees, the walks and benches of Levy Park, and the leaden gray waters of the river flowing past. Even on a dull day like this, Anthony enjoyed being up here. He felt like some ancient king surveying his kingdom. He was deep in thought as he sat there. What on earth was he going to do? What if Hugo Philpotts did buy the house? Anthony didn't know how much houses cost, but he had once heard his dad say that he had paid $12,000 for the house they were living in. And that was a long time ago. Alpheus Winterborn's message said that the treasure was, that was hidden was worth many thousands of dollars. Many was more than twelve, Anthony was sure of that. So even if Hugo Philpotts had to spend twelve thousand dollars to get a treasure that was worth a hundred thousand or a million, it would be a good deal for him. And once he bought the house, he wouldn't have to worry about old Eagle Eye. It would be his house, and if he wanted to poke holes in the walls, that would be his business. Anthony had to get in there before Mr. Philpotts did, but how in heck was he going to do that? He continued to sit and think, but no ideas came to him. The wind blew and the weather vane thrummed overhead. After a while, Anthony heaved a deep sigh and got up. He had better go downstairs and see if Mrs. Pratt wanted him to do anything. As he was leaving the room, he glanced at one of the magazines on the dusty stack. Some words on the cover caught his eye. Burglar proof your home this summer. See page 106. Anthony flipped to page 106 and started reading. The article gave 13 rules for homeowners, including such things as not letting milk bottles and newspapers pile up on your porch, notifying the police when you went on vacation, and leaving lights on in the house. Rule 10 interested Anthony very much. Rule 10, on doors with old-fashioned locks, there's usually a plate on the doorpost with two holes. It looks like this. The lower hole, the oblong one, is meant to receive the door latch, which moves when the knob is turned. The upper hole, square in shape, is meant to receive the bolt, which turns when the key is turned in the keyhole. 
It is the upper hole that we are concerned with. A favorite trick of burglars is to insert a chip of wood in this hole so that the bolt, when thrown home by the turning of the key, will not enter the hole. The door, thus tampered with, is not locked and may be opened at the convenience of our friend the burglar. It would be well to check the outside doors of your home nightly to make sure they, are not, they have not been tampered with. Cellar doors in particular are vulnerable. Note any suspicious persons prowling about in your yard as they may be burglars looking for a chance to fix your door in the manner described above. Anthony sat on the heap of magazines reading by the fading light. His heart started beating faster. This was the way. Could he? Of course he could. He would have to, to save his family and to keep old Hugo Philpotts from grabbing the loot. He would bide his time, watch carefully, and then... And we will pause there.